On this show, we keep telling you about India's growing defense prowess because it is honestly one of the most incredible stories of our time. Look at the Indian Army's latest feat. The Indian Army has set up two of the world's highest tank repair facilities near the LAC, the line of actual control with China. These are medium maintenance facilities. One of them is in a village called Neoma. This is where it is on the map of India. The other Indian tank repair facility is near KM148 in the DBO or Dollar Big Oldie sector. India already has the world's highest airstrip here. I'm talking about the Dollar Big Oldie Advanced Landing Ground. Dollar Big Oldie lies south of the Karakuram Pass. On its west is Siachen. On its east is Aksai Chin. I also mentioned Neoma. It is at a height of 4180 meters, 4180 meters. How many armed forces can claim to have repair facilities at such heights? Like I was telling you, this is an incredible story. These new tank repair facilities will help India's combat fleet remain operationally ready. They will enhance serviceability, also mission reliability of India's tanks and combat vehicles. Ladakh, as some of you may, have, may already know, has rugged terrain. The weather conditions also are challenging. The temperature in, Lada in Ladakh can dip down to minus 40 degrees. It is not an easy task to maintain war machines at this super high altitude. It's even more difficult to get them back to bases in the plains for repair work and then carry them up again. It's a logistical challenge. It's a, it also adds to the cost. Tanks need to be airlifted in transport carriers like C-17, C-130. The back and forth also compromises on war preparedness. Reports say the Indian Army has over 500 tanks and combat vehicles deployed in eastern Ladakh. This includes the T-90, T-72, quick reaction fighting vehicles, the K-9 Vajra self-propelled howitzers, infantry combat vehicles, armored vehicles. It's a long list. And why not? India has had to significantly increase its deployment in Ladakh since the standoff with China. Now, the army is creating infrastructure to maintain these vehicles and shelter them in face of extreme temperature. Reports say the Indian army is cr creating structures to house its tanks. Reports also mention that the Indian army will soon deploy the Zoravar light tanks in Ladakh. You see, India is not just bolstering its land defense. It is also securing its seas. India has unveiled a midget submarine. This is Arovana. India's new weapon in the era of underwater warfare. Arovana has been designed to execute covert military operations. This is a stealth midget submarine. It can take part in intelligence gathering, reconnaissance missions. It can operate in shallow as well as in deep waters. Its makers, in fact, say Arovana's position is unparalleled, as is its efficiency. This midget submarine has been developed by Mazagon Dock Shipbuilders Limited. It was built by integrating advanced technologies. I'm talking about sonar, GPS, inertial navigation system. This is not an unmanned underwater drone. You know, like the Northrop, uh, like the Northrop uh, Grumman's uh, monster Manta Ray or the ghost shark that Australia has developed. India's midget submarine can seat a pilot. It can also seat a co-pilot and a team of combat, combat swimmers. There's also enough space for their equipment. Mazagon Dock says it is also coming up with a successor of Aravana. The MSX-02A midget submarine is expected to be an even more advanced stealth war machine. Time now for Gravitas Recall. Let's have a look at what happened way back in history on the 16th of May, that's today. On this day in 1975, Junko Tabe became the first woman to reach the summit of the Mount Everest, the world's tallest mountain. Tabe was from Japan's Fukushima prefecture. In 1975, Tabe was leading a team of 15 women climbers and six Sherpas. The team was going to climb the Everest summit 
and show the male-dominated patriarchal Japanese society what women were capable of at that point. The first part of the climb went smoothly, but on the 4th of May 1975, disaster struck the team when their camp was hit by an avalanche. At that time, the team was at 6,300 meters. Tabe and, Foru, and, uh, Tabe and four other climbers who were buried under the snow, Tabe lost consciousness. When she was rescued, she could barely walk. Tabe took just two days to recover and now the question was, what was the team going to do next? Would they continue the climb? There was just enough oxygen for one woman to, to continue the climb and the team nominated Tabe. Tabe decided to start the climb along with her Sherpa. She reached the summit of Mount Everest on the 16th of May. She was standing at 8,848 meters above the sea level. Junko Tabe was the first woman to be there. How did she feel? Overwhelmed. And years later, in an interview, Junko Tabe said, I did not intend to be the first woman on Everest. She said she would rather be remembered as the 36th person to reach the peak. A state of emergency has been imposed in New Caledonia. For the last few days, the archipelago is reeling with chaos and violence. At least four have died, more than 300 injured. Why is all of this happening? Let's deep dive. Starting with the basics, New Caledonia is an island territory in the South Pacific. This is where it lies on a map. It is one of the five island territories held by France across the Indo-Pacific. The archipelago was annexed by France in 1853. It was used as a penal colony until the turn of the 20th century. New Caledonia is home to some 270,000 people. 41% of them belong to the indigenous tribe Melanesian Canucks. 24% are of European origin mostly French. Tensions first began to rise back in the 1970s. A boom in nickel production attracted outsiders. In fact, New Caledonia still remains the world's number three nickel producer. With outsiders came conflicts. The Canucks feared marginalization, so they launched independence movements. However, peace came about in 1998 after the Nomea Accord. The accord outlined a path to gradual autonomy in New Caledonia. How so? By making the voting rights exclusive. Only Kanak people, the migrants living in New Caledonia before 1998 and their children could vote in the elections. And this gave greater representation to the Kanaks. The accord also allowed for three referendums to determine the future of the country. In all three, the people of the territory rejected independence from France. Fast forward to 2024, things have changed. Now Paris has come to view the arrangement as undemocratic. So the lawmakers have approved a constitutional amendment. It would open the electorate to people who have lived in New Caledonia for at least 10 years. The Canucks are clearly not happy. The visuals coming out of New Caledonia speak for themselves. Riots began even before the French lawmakers voted on the bill. Gunshots were heard in parts of New Caledonia. The streets were on fire. Burnt cars remained strewn on the roads as plumes of smoke rose up. Protesters damaged properties and looted stores. Following the chaos, a curfew was imposed in the capital, schools were shut, the airport was closed, flights were suspended, but the riots continued all the same. And this is the aftermath. This is how New Caledonia looks today.
just now listen in to the accounts of those who are witnessing it firsthand. It's a Caledonia that's not recognizable today. We talk about sharing, we talk about time to talk, but Caledonia is not what you think. And I, I'm a new Caledonian. I no longer know my country anymore. The roadblocks created by terrorists are very difficult to pass through. So, in fact, we are subjected to insults, to threats of being beaten, of having our cars attacked, burned or destroyed, while we attempt to get to the places that we want to reach. It's very difficult during the day, very difficult in the day and even at night. The truth is that at night, you can't even try to go out. We feel oppressed. We are angry. Everything is taking place over there. And us, we are wondering, are we being heard? We, the Canuck people? What I've noticed is that no one ever thinks of us. We talk of sharing, of equality. But that never existed. Three young Canucks and a police official were killed in the riots. Following that, France declared a state of emergency in New Caledonia. It is going to be in place for the next 12 days at least. In normal circumstances, 1,800 French police officers are present in the territory. Now France has sent 500 more. French ministers also called for a crisis meeting. The French President Emmanuel Macron is trying to take a Dekanak's uh, view into account or making it appear that way at least. He has said he would delay rubber stamping the bill into law. He has invited representatives of the territory's population to Paris for talks. He has given a deadline for that. He says a new agreement must be reached by June or he would sign the bill into law. What will happen in the next few hours? France is hoping to get a hold of the situation and restore calm in the, in the archipelago. Will it succeed is the question. Even if it does, what about the new rules? Will they come into effect? Or will more riots, chaos and death follow?